Welcome to 20th NELTA International Conference 2024. Here we have our long waited, our <laughs> keynote speaker, Professor Dr. Stephen Krashen. Uh, now, please allow me to give a short introduction of Professor Krashen. Dr. Stephen Krashen is a professor emeritus at University of Southern California. He's active in language acquisition, bilingual education, literacy, and heritage language development, and has published over 500 professional papers and books. Many of his books are available for free download at www.sdcrashen.com. We are on the Facebook Live. If you have any questions, queries, and comments, please be specific and write in the comment box section. We'll try to entertain your comment in Q&A section. Without delay, with a round of applause, we would like to welcome Anelta. Nepal is pleased to welcome Professor Krasen. Over to you, Krasen. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to begin my talk by giving you some language lessons. I want to talk about my ideas about how language is acquired. We'll talk about language acquisition. Then I want to introduce three amazing research results. Not my results, other people, but I think they're amazing and very, very useful, okay? The benefits, we're gonna talk mostly about reading. The benefits of pleasure reading, reading what you want to read, reading that you select that is interesting. Okay, let me begin with the language lesson. I'll use a language I'm pretty sure you don't speak. Maybe a couple of you do, and you can tell me which of the two lessons you like better. Here's lesson number one. Wir werden jetzt anfangen, Deutsch zu lernen. Und ich möchte Ihnen voraussagen, dass nach meiner Meinung, Deutsch ist eine sehr schöne Sprache. Und ich hoffe, dass Sie alle sehr viel Erfolg mit Deutsch haben werden. That's lesson number one. Now, lesson number two. Das ist mein Kopf. Kopf. Ja, verstehen Sie das? Kopf, gut. Hier sind meine Augen. Meine Augen. Ich habe zwei Augen. Eins, zwei. Hier sind meine Ohren. Hier sind meine Ohren. Ich habe zwei Ohren. Eins, zwei. Und hier ist mein Mund. Mein Mund, ja. Those are the two lessons. I think the first lesson was not very helpful. Lesson number two, you understood something. If you understood even a little bit of lesson number two, you acquired a little bit of German. And now the central hypothesis in language acquisition, we acquire language in one way, and I think only one way, when we understand it when we understand what people tell us, or we understand what we read. We call this comprehensible input, understanding what we read, understanding what we, read, what we hear. We do not acquire language when we speak. We do not acquire language when we write. We do not acquire language when we learn grammar rules consciously and practice them. The ability to use a language, to speak a language, to write, or to, uh, to the ability to speak a language, to write, or to talk, is the result of language acquisition. I remember when I was in a teacher education class, when I first started out, we had to do practice lessons. And I created a lesson for the students. This was an ESL class. And I told him a story, which I thought was a good idea. And the instructor said, oh, no, you shouldn't be talking. The students should be talking. I now think that's wrong. I think talking doesn't help you. Listening helps you. Reading helps you. Now, let me talk about good input. What input is that really counts, that really helps? Good input is, number one, comprehensible. Number two, interesting. And we want it to be as interesting as 
possible. I like the word compelling. Compelling means the input is so interesting, you are not even aware you're listening to another language. That's what we want. And there has to be a lot of it, okay? My focus today is on one kind of input, one way of giving people comprehensible input, and that's through reading, through what I call free voluntary reading. Reading because you want to, that you find interesting, not assigned reading, but reading that you select that you think is going to be interesting. And now a wonderful mystical fact. If you could hear me give the second German lesson and you understood some of it, you don't have to understand all of it, you acquired some language and you had no choice. Let me say that again. You acquired some language and you had no choice. You can't decide not to understand. If the input is comprehensible and you understand it, you will acquire a little bit of language whether you want to or not. Uh, Noam Chomsky says the language acquisition device is a mental organ. It's kind of like vision. It's kind of like hearing. When you open your eyes and you look around and there's light, you're going to see whether you want to or not. You don't consciously decide, I'm going to see. You don't consciously decide, I'm going to hear. It simply happens. That's the way the brain is made, okay? I'm going to talk about three benefits of free voluntary reading, of comprehensible, interesting reading. And I think these make life much easier for our students and for us. Benefit number one. Our benefit number one, speaking and writing ability, our ability to do grammar, spelling, vocabulary, comes from understanding what we read and understanding what we hear. It doesn't come from practice. It comes from reading itself and listening itself. I'm going to focus on reading today. I'm not going to give you all the research today. I'm going to give you a small bit, just examples. If you want to see all the research, I it's there in my book. Let me tell you about my book. It's called The Power of Reading. It was published in 2004, and it has lots and lots of research, and I think it's comprehensible. I do not suggest that you go buy it. It's too expensive. If you uh, go to the um, to the internet and you look up power of reading, it's going to cost you twenty dollars, twenty five American dollars, thirty dollars. That's a lot of money. I recommend instead that you buy a used copy. Okay, you can get a used copy for as little as two dollars. I think that's much more economical. Uh, I want to talk about assigned versus voluntary reading, and then give you some data. When I was in high school in the United States, secondary school, it was all in English, and we did literature. We did assigned reading. We did classics of British literature. We did classics of American literature, and we took tests. I read all the books. I passed the tests. Today, I don't remember a single book I read in secondary school. I don't remember the titles of any of them. I don't remember what they're all about. But the reading I did on my own, that I decided to read, that I wanted to read, I remember nearly all of it. I did three kinds of reading when I was young when I was in elementary school and secondary school, reading on my own. Number one was comic books. I read lots of comic books all the time. My father is responsible for that, and I thank him for that. When I was in the first grade, second grade, third grade, I was in the lowest reading group. My father brought home comic books, and he said, Stephen, read these comic books if you like them. 
I will always buy you more. Don't worry, I will be happy to pay for them. He brought home comics. I read them. I love them. In one year, I was in the medium group. The second year after that, I was one of the best readers in the class. Okay. Uh, this is what happens. I read comic books. I'll tell you what else I read. I read baseball stories. Baseball stories. In the United States, baseball was very, very important. And eventually I read science fiction. That's all I read when I was a boy and when I was a teenager. And my literacy was extremely high. I got interested in comic books because I read them to my son and to help him go to sleep. And after he fell asleep, I read the comic books on my own. I found them to be absolutely wonderful. I found them to be very, very good literature. I read baseball stories. Let me tell you about baseball. Uh, I don't know if you understand the baseball game, but this will be quite simple. The baseball stories were amazing. I read as many of them as I could find. Uh, in fact, I wrote some technical papers on this and they're published. You can find them on the internet about what happens when you read baseball stories and you really like it. I'll tell you about one. In this one story, which I, again, I remember to this day, the baseball team decides they need a new manager. The old manager retires. So they take one of the players and they appoint him as manager because the owner thought he had good judgment. Okay, the story that really worked, this new manager wanted to impress all the players because he was so young. And he said, I've got some news for you. When you hit the ball and it goes to someone on the field, if they pick it up and they can make it, get it to first place really quickly, you will be out. You will be out. It'll be done for you. But I said, even though you know you won't make it to first base, you'll be out. Run fast. Try your best. Run like hell. And the reason? The fielder might drop the ball. He won't get to first base if he's dropped the ball. He may throw the ball and it'll go in the wrong place. You'll be safe on first base. Now, this isn't going to happen in professional baseball. 99 times out of 100, you will be out but run as fast as you can anyway. You might make it to first base and you'll be okay. What I learned from that uh, passage, and I made copies of it and I talked about it in my article. The advice is good philosophy. It says, be perfect, be impeccable. If you do something, do it very well, even if it fails. I found this to be terrific advice, and I think of this passage constantly as a grown-up. When I'm in the house and I'm trying to clean the house and I have to wash the dishes, I wash the dishes perfectly. I dry them perfectly. I put them all away. I try to be impeccable, and I think of this baseball story. The baseball stories were absolutely wonderful. Uh, I told a friend of mine about this. My friend of mine, this friend uh, is a doctor. And he said, this is good advice for a doctor. If you're a doctor and you have a patient and you think it's a very simple problem, give him this medicine, he'll be fine. Be impeccable. Make sure he gets the right medicine. Make sure he takes the medicine. Make sure there's no bad thing that happens afterwards. In other words, be impeccable, even in little things. Now, what I want to do now is give you one experiment. There are many, many, and you can read them in The Power of Reading. And I think this is the best one. The co-author was my student, Fei Xin, who became you know, quite a, uh, uh, quite a master teacher. And I was the third author here. And here's what it's called. It's called Sophia's Choice because it's the story of a young girl named Sophia who came to the United States from China. Her first language was Mandarin. She came to the United States knowing very, very little English. She was about in the fifth grade, okay? 
at the school she went to, <clears throat> excuse me, what they do is at the beginning of the semester, they give the students a test of English. And then during the year, you go to ESL class and they assume you'll get better. Sophia didn't get better. She got worse. All her scores in English were worse than at the beginning of the year. She would take the test at the beginning of the year. She didn't go up. But at the end of the year, she took another test and she was worse than she was at the beginning. Wow. Well, she would then go home during the summer, summer vacation. When she came back after summer vacation, she took the test again. Guess what? Her test scores were fantastic. In the During the year when she took ESL classes, she got worse. At the end of the year, just going home, having a good time over the summer, she got better and her English was excellent over the year after that. <clears throat> what did she do during the summer? She went to the local public library. Now, this was in Los Angeles, and Los Angeles during the summer can get pretty hot. So what Sophia did, she went to the local public library, which was air-conditioned. She went to the nice air-conditioned section that was, that was full of books for beginning readers of English. She read those books for pleasure. She didn't try to remember the words. She didn't underline things. She just read the books because she liked them. She read Sweet Valley High. Uh, she read books that were designed for young readers because they were good. Kids like them. Okay. That was Sophia's choice. Reading for pleasure. Reading for pleasure. She got better and better and better. Relaxing reading nice books over the summers. Nancy Drew was one of her favorites too, and she got better. When she took ESL classes and studied, she got worse. Brilliant. Well, uh, you not some people criticize this. They said, we don't like this because if you're just reading books for pleasure and they're easy, these books were easy in the beginning, uh, you're not going to get important vocabulary. You'll only get simple vocabulary. Well, one of my colleagues, who was actually my student once, and now he is quite a master. His name is Jeff McQuillan. He looked at these books that um, kids read, and he found that a lot of books that kids read that they like have academic words in them. What McQuillan found, if you read all seven Harry Potter novels, you will encounter over 200 academic words. Reading them is three times as easy as studying. So if you read for pleasure, you'll get everyday words, you get normal words, and you'll get a good deal of academic words. Well, that's number one. More reading is going to help your grammar, your vocabulary, your writing, everything related to language. Here's benefit Number two, the more you read, the more you know. Wonderful study done about 20 years ago. Uh, Stanovich was one of the authors. He went to a local secondary school and he gave the students there tests of how much knowledge they had. Uh, tests of, oh gosh, tests of uh, technology, health, current events, cultural knowledges, cultural knowledge. Typical question, what part of the body does the infection called pneumonia occur in the lungs? Do you know who these people are? Linus Pauling, Isaac Newton, Bertrand Russell. Here's what they found. They found, first of all, the people who knew more about all these things, who had knowledge and things we want students to know, those students did more reading that they liked. They could identify more everyday authors. These were students who read novels. They read magazines. They asked students for their grades in school. Students with the higher grades, very poor predictor of how much you knew, very poor. Hard study does not give you this knowledge. But reading books for pleasure 
does. Reading books for pleasure gives you the knowledge we want secondary school graduates to have. I found out about this in real life. In California, where I live, um, if you're a voter, every few years you have to do what's called jury duty. You have to go to trial, listen to the you know arguments, and help decide if the person on trial is guilty or innocent. Okay, so you've got to do that on jury duty. I was on one jury, and because I was a university professor, I was elected the jury foreman, the head of the jury. They got the wrong guy. Let me tell you, I didn't do a good job. Excuse me, we'll have a little drink here. We listened to the case, and nine out of 10 of us decided that the person on trial was guilty. He was accused of child abuse, very serious. And we decided, we looked at all the evidence, we decided this guy is guilty. One person, oh, the, the judge told us, if you decide he's guilty, we're not simply gonna send him to jail. We're gonna give him therapy. We're going to cure him. We're going to find out what's wrong and why he had, why he did the child abuse, which he did. Okay. Good idea. So we decided it was a good decision, good for the person, good for society, good for the legal system to find this young man guilty, which we did. Okay. One year later, I read a book called The Runaway, Runaway Jury written by John Grisham. When I read that book, I learned a lot about juries. I learned that I could replace a juror who wasn't doing it right. I could have had this person replaced early. This would have saved a second trial. This would have saved the taxpayers a lot of money and a lot of wasted time. And it would have been reading fiction where I'd find out about juries. <clears throat> well, this is two benefits. Benefit one is you get knowledge and you get language. Uh, I'm sorry, benefit one, you get language, uh, you get vocabulary, you get grammar. Benefit two, you get knowledge. There's a third benefit, and I want to tell you what some people have said about this. Uh, one is someone named Terry Gross, who's a Los Angeles radio host of a program called Fresh Air, and she was talking about reading one day, and she said something that was absolutely, I thought, brilliant. She said, when you read fiction, what you're learning is empathy. You're learning to be somebody else. Learning to see the world through their eyes. When you read a good storybook, you identify with the characters. You feel what they feel. You see what they see that gives you understanding of other people, how they react, how they behave. Brilliant. I thought that was a wonderful benefit for reading fiction. Uh, the same thing comes from someone you've heard of, a very famous person named Barack Obama. I'll tell you what Obama said, and then I'll tell you what my son said about Barack Obama, because my son actually met him and shook hands with him, quite a privilege. Barack Obama said this, when I think about how I understand my role as citizen, the most important things I've learned, I've learned from novels. Barack Obama says the most important thing he's learned as a politician, as a citizen, he's learned from novels. It has to do with empathy. It has to do with being com comfortable with the concept the world is complicated, full of grays, and there's still truth to be found. It's possible to connect with someone else, even though they're very different from you. My son met Barack Obama and had the same, the same impression. Here's someone who's listening carefully, who respects what other person says and respects what he reads. My son won an award, I have to brag, he won an award for mathematics in secondary school. And the winners of this award were invited to the university 
and they got to meet famous people and talk to them. That was their reward. And my son met Barack Obama, shook hands with him. And I said to him, what was it like talking to Barack Obama? When Barack Obama talks to you, he listens to what you say. He's not in another world. He pays attention. That's what he learned by reading novels, that the things you can learn from everybody. The third person I want to talk about is Noam Chomsky, great intellectual. Here's what Chomsky says. It's quite possible and overwhelmingly probable that we will always learn more about human life and personality from novels than from scientific psychology. Chomsky says, read fiction, read novels. You find out more about people than looking at scientific research. So I've said three things about reading. Gives you three things. Number one, reading gives you language. It gives you spelling. It gives you grammar. It gives you all these things. Number two, reading gives you knowledge, all kinds of knowledge in many different areas. Number three, <clears throat> reading helps you understand other people. And this is pleasure reading that you have selected yourself. The people who are the most intelligent is from what they've read, from what they know. I remember when I was in the high school and I was sitting in class and I was sitting next to one of the uh, athletes. He wasn't a good student. He wouldn't talk to me. I was beneath his status, okay? Uh, he would only talk to other athletes. And he had decided when he finished secondary school, he was going to join the military, which I thought was a pretty good decision for him and his interest. He had a paperback book with him that he was reading. It was a war novel. I thought that was a very good choice. He would understand more about the military, what the army is like, what, it's, what it means to go into combat, uh, et cetera. So it's self-selected reading that really, really counts, in my opinion. Well, we've talked about reading. Let's talk a little bit about writing. Does writing help you? The more you write, it doesn't mean you'll be a better writer. More writing will not make you a better writer. Writing is output. We acquire language from input, but writing has benefits. Writing can make you smarter. Let me tell you how it look, how it works. This was an article written by a mathematician. His name is Poincaré, written in 1924. And he says, when he has a block, when he's writing something, and we're going to see blocks are good. We have writing blocks all the time. We don't know what to write next. He gets up from his desk and does something mindless. He puts wood on the fire, takes him one minute, comes back to his writing. His subconscious mind begins to break up the writer's block for him and tell him what comes next. It gives him a part of the solution. For me, my writing all day long is writing, writing, writing. I get stuck. I get stuck all the time. I get stuck every few minutes. I get up, wash a few dishes, do something mindless. You come back. Your subconscious mind has been thinking about the problem, and you start to see a little bit of the solution. Okay. In my opinion, your subconscious mind wants to help you, and you do it by being quiet, and it gives you the answer to the problem that's on your mind right now. Profound. Eckhart Tolle says the same thing, philosopher. He says, all true artists, whether they know it or not, create from a place of no mind, a place of inner stillness. This is what writing does for us. Let me stop here and ask you if you have any questions, and I'll ask and answer one question. How do we encourage students to read more? But let me stop here. 
and see if you have any questions so far. Let's take a one minute break while your subconscious mind is thinking of the right question that you want to ask. And I'll drink a little bit of water and pour a little bit more. Your subconscious is telling you what to ask. And I have to tell you, I love teachers' questions. The teachers' questions are the result of their years of experience dealing with real students, and they're always very, very good. So question number one, if you don't have the right question, I will yes. ask it. Yes, uh, Professor Krasin, there is a question for you. The, one of the teachers asked about the relationship between the input and the conscious mind that we convert into learning. What is the relationship between input and the conscious mind that we are relating with reading and writing just before earlier? The conscious mind comes later. What you do is you have a problem, you take a break, your subconscious mind solves it when you, when you relax a moment, when you do something else, then you tell the conscious mind. The conscious mind can then write it down for you and you won't lose it. By the way, I believe in taking, in having pencil and paper everywhere, wherever you go. You never know when you're going to get a new idea. I have pencil and paper with me everywhere I go. I even have pencil and paper with me, you know where. Okay, never go anywhere without it. Walking and driving are not very productive for new ideas. When you're walking, you usually don't have pencil and paper. When you're driving, you never have pencil and paper. If I get a new idea while I'm driving, I stop the car as soon as I can. And I write down the new idea. So the conscious mind looks at the output of your, of your subconscious mind and writes it down. Very good question. Thank you. One Next more question. question to add. David, we have a relationship between input and output, but to how to strengthen the intake process, they want they are, one of the participants wants a, wants a query from you. How to increase the intake? You can increase the intake by increasing reading. And there are two, I was going to talk about this anyway. There are two very simple ways simple ways of encouraging reading in young people, especially. Uh, they were published in a, a library journal, and I've never seen them quoted, and I'll tell you why when I finish. Number one is a brilliant one-page paper called Spider-Man in the Library. The article said, if you want to get students to read more, go into the school before they come into class and put comic books on the tables right there where they can pick them up and start to read. In the experiment that this researcher did, they found pleasure reading increased in that school, not just the reading of comics, but all reading increased because the comic books were available. We'll talk a little about comics later if we have time. So that's one way. The second way is we encourage students when they're in the library and they find a good book and they think other students will like it, put a big mark in the book. Then other students will pick up the book, will find there are 10 marks in the book and other students are going to read it. Other students do read it when they see other kids have read it and they like it. Now these methods, no research has been done in these methods other than the original research because nobody makes money on it. It's free. Spider-Man in the library, putting comic books in the library is free. Mark up your book is free. It's not like giving them a reward. You don't need money to do this. So it doesn't make rich people richer. It's a simple, very simple experiment and it absolutely works in my opinion. Okay, let's go on to the next question. And I'll talk a little more about Spider-Man. Let me do that. Let me talk about Spider-Man a little bit. Um, I met the person who invented Spider-Man. Uh, I gave a talk at a school and they invited Stan Lee, 
the president of Marvel Comics and the origin, one of the originators of Spider-Man, they invited him to give a talk. And he came and gave a brilliant talk. And I went to the talk. I wanted to hear Stan Lee. And the end of the talk, I raised my hand. And, you know, Spider-Man in real life is named Peter Parker, who's a high school student. And he's very good at inventing things, web shooters. And he can go from building to building. I said, when is Peter Parker going to go to graduate school? And Stanley and I had a conversation about it. He said, stick around. I want to talk to you. He thought it was a very good idea. And in the Los Angeles Times, two weeks later, in the Spider-Man comic book, Peter Parker went to the local college and he asked about going to college, how he could go to graduate school, et cetera. So that was my influence. In other words, I'm very, very proud of that. I want to tell you what Stan Lee told me, though, which was very interesting about writing fiction. He said, the best fiction is where there's a problem, a serious problem. He said his favorite characters always had problems. Spider-Man has problems all the time. That's what it's about. His favorite character was the Silver Surfer. The Silver Surfer went on a surf that could go in outer space, and he went to different planets. But the Silver Surfer had a big problem. The bad people, the villains, had captured his parents. And if he doesn't do bad things for them, they're going to murder his parents. That's a real problem. Good Spider-Man comic books are full of problems. I'm going to take a few moments and tell you about my favorite Spider-Man comic book, which I think is marvelous. It's about uh, 20 years ago. And in this uh, comic book, Spider-Man is coming home from one of his adventures. He's swinging from building to building. And he hears the sound of an automobile accident, a crash. He goes down to the surface, changes to Peter Parker. A young lady was driving and her car was hit hard from behind. They have called the paramedics and the ambulance is coming to take her to the hospital. He talks, Peter Parker talks to the ambulance driver and they say, she is going to need a transplant. Her kidneys have been damaged. At least one needs to be replaced. And they asked him, do you know of any relatives that this young lady has? Peter Parker talks to the young lady and she says, yes, I live with my twin brother. And she tells Spider-Man where she lives, or Peter Parker. He goes to the building where Donnie lives. He looks up, and there on the roof is someone about to jump. Oh, my. Could that be Donnie? He calls up. It is Donnie. It is the twin brother. Peter Parker calls up and says, uh, he changes to Spider-Man. He says, Spider-Man says, Donnie, don't jump, don't jump. Donnie looks down, looks at Spider-Man and says, I'm going to jump and you can't stop me. I've got problems, problems that I can't solve. I'm going to end my life. I just can't go on like this. And Spider-Man, and, and then Donnie says, besides, you're a superhero. You're Spider-Man. You don't have problems. And Spider-Man looks at Donnie and says, do you think life is easy behind this mask? Do you think because I'm a superhero, I don't have problems? Spider-Man says, everybody has problems. And we grow by facing our problems and trying to solve them. And then he says, besides, if you jump, he says to Donnie, if you jump, you're killing your sister as well. And then Donnie says, okay, for my sister. He comes down. They go to the hospital. The operation is a success. As Peter Parker is leaving the hospital, he's thinking, this one turned out okay. She's going to live. It's going to be okay. But Donnie is still depressed. There's not much I can do for him. I hope he feels better. In other words, you can't solve everybody's problems. This is the quality of today's comic books. They are exceptional. They are very, very good. And I recommend them in language classes. Okay, time for more questions. There are no specific questions at the moment. 
Thank you. Okay. Just one question. Okay. Just right now. Can you share okay. something more about the input hypothesis? So well, that... I've been talking about the input hypothesis the whole time. Because reading is a wonderful kind of input. We have done studies. I just got one published. It'll be out soon. Where we compared, for learning new grammar, study, living in the country where the language is spoken or taking classes uh, or reading. It turns out reading is by far the best way. Reading for pleasure is by far, I think, one of the absolute best things you can do for a new language, which means the library is a very important place. The best thing we can do for language development, for knowledge development, is to make sure every school has an excellent school library with lots and lots of very good books. The school library is, or the public library, is a place where students can get good reading for free. Isn't that wonderful? So the library is the most, really, where the studies have shown that if a school has a good library, reading scores are higher. And a teacher who understands what children like to read. Okay. Anything else before we all fall asleep? Okay, everybody. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Go out, find some good books, and make sure there are comic books around in all languages. Oh, by the way, I, there's one research result that I left out that might be of some interest to you. We have been looking at what are called heritage languages. For example, in the United States, we have a lot of students from Mexico, and they come speaking pretty good Spanish. Uh, but after a while, they stop speaking Spanish because English takes over. We have found that the children who find good books to read in the family language become bilingual. They get both languages very, very well. So it's a wonderful way to develop the family language as well. Okay, everybody, thank you for your patience. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much, Professor Krasen, for your speech and sharing about the amazing power of self-directed learning and how it relates with the mental processing of input processing and the knowledge generation and the creation of new knowledge. Exactly. <laughs> Your contribution in the field of input and tech and the complete knowledge processing has always been enormous to the world. Truly speaking, you are an, you are an icon for the second language acquisition. Well, thank you. Thank a, you. A, a person who hasn't who has gone through SLA and has not heard about your work would be an injustice to the language of academia and language of research and particularly second language research. Okay. Nepal English Language Association Nelta is highly honored with your sharing in the conference.